We begin in Nigeria, where reactions have followed the announcement from the vice president that he will run for the post of president. Former Lagos state governor and fellow presidential aspirant, Bola Tinubu, says, no son of his, no son of mine, is ripe to declare or run. It is widely believed that Mr. Tinubu played a major role in his emergence as President Muhammad Buhari's running mate in 2015. Mr. Tinubu spoke shortly after a meeting with 12 APC governors at Gabi State Governor's Lodge in Abuja. Your son has just declared, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have no son grown enough to declare. Okay, Tundo. Is this disowning him? He said he's got no son. What is happening, Tundo? That's not how I see it. Okay. I mean, I did think of King Lear, William Shakespeare's King Lear, when he said of his daughter, Goneril, how thankless, you know, how sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child and that bitterness that he felt. And you know how that ended. But, oh, King Lear. I used mm. to teach Shakespeare and his contemporaries. I know. That's English why I turned to you. Seven. That's why I it turned was. to you. It was. That was the title of the course. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's the same here. That's actually a literal father and daughter situation. Mm. I don't think the vice president at the age of 65 can be de described as the son of Ashiwaju Tinubu, who's 70, surely. I think that's yeah. a bit of a stretch. But it does appear to me that that issue of disloyalty will continue to recur at this stage in the proceedings. But with regards to um, the comments from Ashiwaju there saying he doesn't have a son old enough to declare, I don't think that that much should be read into it. Maybe just me. That's not my, the way my mind works. I'm not going to go beyond exactly what he has said. If he wants to disown, if he wants to criticize, if he wants to make remarks, he's you know, more than capable of doing that. He did not do that. He only said, that's not his son. And it can't be. There's a five-year age gap. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really going to infer more than is necessary, I don't think, into that. OK. Dr. Bati? Well, I mean, the question I thought was ambiguous. And I was wondering whether the reporter was trying to be mischievous. Yes, I think uh, they were. That may be well the intendment mischief. Because when I say, oh, uh, your son and all of that. Look, let's face it. Uh, Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo may be a humble person. You know, he may have the mien of a very quiet, humble person. But for heaven's sake, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo is 65 years old. So, you cannot uh, just refer to him as his son. Your son has declared. And uh, Tinubu would then respond and say, uh, I don't have a son who is old enough to declare for any such uh, position. No, sorry. That's uh, quite uh, presumptuous. It's quite uh, disrespectful. You cannot refer to a 65-year-old man. You know, whatever may have been the circumstances of his uh, emergence in the public space. And don't forget, I, I made this point yesterday. Maybe I didn't stress it too well. His first appointment was a four-year, 1988 to 1992 appointment as special advisor, legal and litigation to former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Justice Bola Jibola, who is now an elder statesman. Okay? So I think... Uh, Ashwa Jibola Tinumbu must have picked him up on the basis of, you know, his uh, distinction, his uh, efforts in that direction. And I listed yesterday some of his uh, achievements. But, you know, journalists have to do what they have to do. So to that extent, okay, it will look like a good question because it's now the big story that everybody uh, is talking about today. But the contest is even more important in what regard? In the sense that after... Uh, Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo uh, declared for the position yesterday morning. I imagine that a man who is uh, a very strong strategist like Ashiwaju uh, Bola Metinubu will have known that that was coming yesterday. So he had made the effort uh, to approach the uh, Progressive Governors Forum uh, within the APC and to ensure that they met. They met at the Kebi. Uh, you know, uh, uh, government house uh, liaison office in Abuja, in Asukuro, and 12 of them were in attendance. At the end of it, Bagudu, the governor of uh, Kirby State, who spoke on behalf of the other governors, said, yes, the governors have heard, uh, we will come together, uh, we have listened to a presidential aspirant, 
and uh, we will see, uh, you know, what decision we will take uh, one way or the other beyond this. Okay, what is the symbolism of that? These governors will meet with any aspirant that calls them together. So from a point of view of strategy, I don't think anybody should put so much weight, you know, on that meeting. But as a reaction to Vice President Oshibajo challenging his uh, former boss and saying, I'm also good enough for the job. I'm not his son. He, they, this guy is 65 years old. I mean. <laughs> why, are you, uh, why are they describing him as if uh, the man is wearing, uh, you know, he's, in, he's a toddler wearing pampas in politics? You know, that amounts to some kind of underestimation, which I think does not make sense. However, the final point is that it was also a demonstration. The meeting on Sunday between Vice President Oshibajo and the governors, and the meeting yesterday between Aspirant Bola Tinumbu and the governors, is an indication of how very powerful these governors have become. They determine the delegates. The uh, introduction of Section 84, Subsection 12 in the Electoral Act may well, on the wrong, long run, curb their influence. But whether it is PDP or it is the APC, these uh, governors, they are overlords. And you can't count on them. In 2014, 2015, they will collect money from you. We saw it. They were mobilized. They were energized. They were empowered. They were weaponized. What did they do at the end of the day? What did they do? The ones in the east did not mobilize anybody. Nobody came out. The ones in the north. In fact, look, it was later that people were, were telling us that uh, some of the governors, when we went to campaign, were, were telling their people that uh, uh, Lantani, Lantani, Okay, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it well, but the meaning of that is that, look, don't, don't put the roof over. This team must just go to decking level. Don't put the roof on top. We were campaigning, and they were telling their people, don't vote for President Jonathan. But they collected, they, they collected uh, mobilization. So politicians can be very tricky, you know. So these governors, uh, they, they may become the beautiful brides. Many of them are pursuing their uh, stomachs. Beleface front uh, politicians. That's what they are pursuing. They will collect from this person. They will collect from that person. They will try to protect themselves. But unfortunately, the way the political process is structured, they remain very powerful. Some of the same governors that went to meet uh, Oshibajo, some of them showed up again. Oh. If tomorrow uh, Rocha Sokorocha calls them, they will still show up there. Eh? So this is the kind of politics we play in uh, Nigeria. But I just hope that the process that is uh, unfolding in the APC we celebrate, uh, separate uh, the pretenders uh, from uh, the serious persons. Because now that the game is uh, going to the level of the big boys, some of the small fries who have shown interest in the game, maybe they will quickly just uh, uh, respect themselves and withdraw so that we can have clarity and we can engage the serious-minded people on both sides of the, uh, of the game. And on all sides, there are 18 registered political parties. And those other... Uh, candidates in the other uh, uh, political parties. Let them wake up too. We can't be talking about PDP and APC every day. Where are they? Ah, if tomorrow I declare for presidency, you see that uh, I will do it beyond the social media. I will take the matter serious. You'll be all over the place. <laughs> I'll be all over the place. And I, and I will recruit all of you here. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Shade Troy, Dr. Abati. So, uh, in, in the famous Twitter lingo, there's something called wawu lens. What? Wawu lens. It just means violence on social media. Oh. People going off at each other. We predicted it and it has happened yesterday. And I think the words of uh, Bola Tinobu that my, I don't have a son grown enough crystallized everything. What happened yesterday after the declaration, a lot happened in the space of four hours. Well, Latinobu went up mobilizing. Got those same 12 governors, easy to reach. The same governors of Shiva just spoke with a day before. Back and forth started. Or Shibajo had to push to consolidate. So there were rallies in most states of the country by the Oshibajo supporters to be able to consolidate and give him a national spread. And they did tactical media showing of those rallies. 
certain media outlets put those rallies on TV to be able to show tactical, you know, power and strength by Shibaji. There were rallies in Taraba, Cross River. He had a spread run by his supporters. The game has started. Some posit that this might be to distract the Southwest. And that's why I'm telling both parties that if they are going to fight, they should be careful. We must also constantly reiterate the fact that if the Tinobu camp feels so offended and he wants to fight and he feels betrayed and all of that, he should remember that Oshibajo knows where most of the legal corpses are buried. And the Oshibajo camp too will send out people and it's going to be a grand fight. Dr. Bati, you've talked a lot about the governors because the governors are the governors for what they are. They collect from everybody. It's a beautiful, bright thing. So they will collect from anybody that comes their way. In all of this, the sticking point is President Buhari. And you know why I said that? As, as we speak, he has not given anybody a convincing word. Anybody that comes to meet President Buhari, he tells all of them to run. So even the analysis that oh, he might have cleared with some of the cabals before he got into the race might not be an all clear for Shibajo. So everything will only be clear during the primaries. Because as we speak today, President Buhari will keep whoever his candidate is to his chest. A newspaper this morning came out to say that he might be putting a dark horse in. Who might be the dark horse? There are indications that Mephi might come into the race anytime. So anyway, he's denied it. But there are indications that some things might shake up and you might see some action this week the or dark next horse week. could be Governor Yahaya Bello. Oh, probably it could be Yahaya Bello or anything. But one thing is, the sticking point in all of this is that the cabals and probably the president keeps telling everybody that you can run. So that's why they are going out to declare, but they are also frightful in all of this. So the politicking has started. I would like both supporters of Tinubu and Oshibachi to tone down the abuses of each other on Twitter and focus on how they can get the delegates. Because in all of this, the governors are the beautiful bride, but also they must look at where the president is tilting towards. Because you see, even if the governors give you your commitment, just like Dr. Abad said, they paid some of the governors that time. I'm sure maybe as you were probably finished paying them, then the governors met with another group of people and said, okay, collect his money. So I'm seeing a lot of cases of collect his money. You just collect. So a lot of them will just collect their money like that. But all of this can be scuttled by a two-hour meeting when the powers that be say, okay, it might tilt this way. So it's going to be a great time for the governors. They're going to have a field day. But also, the candidates should not fight too much so that they don't unearth most of their corpses they buried so that EFCC don't start doing a clean-up job as this process continues and some of them don't make the primaries. Let's not forget, it is only one person that can get the ticket from the APC at the PDP. That's all on News and Live. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, Adesua, and everyone to give us updates on Africa global business, COVID-19, and sporting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to Morning Show here on Arise News. Um, now we're going to Michael Wilson in London for a global business update. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Uh, good morning. Uh, we'll go to Asia Pacific first and uh, basically worries uh, about the slowdown in China because of the zero COVID policy, which is basically causing more or less a complete shutdown of Shanghai. And also uh, inflation figures out from the United States later on today, uh, which will give us an idea of where the Fed's going to go with raising interest rates. Remember, there's a fear that it may be half a percent rise in May. Um, so we'll get a bit more of, uh, of that, actually. That that really is the, the big the big figure um, for today. Um, as far as the markets are concerned, just the detail of it then. So it's struggle, basically, did China um, away from uh, heavy losses um, yesterday. Shanghai about down about 0.6. Um, Hang Seng about 0.6. 0.5 down at the moment. Let's go to Japan, uh, a, a country which has been battling um, deflation for many, many years. Now it's just seeing its inflation rate 
popping up very, very slightly. Uh, you would think that's relatively good news, but it's basically they're suffering from the rise of wholesale prices and the rest of it. It's really a question of whether or not the, uh, the aging population can carry Japan, which is still the world's third largest economy, let's not forget that, um, into a post-pandemic era. Uh, Ukraine uh, is calling for funds for financial support to ensure its survival. Um, about 30% of its businesses are shuttered uh, at the moment. And um, the, the kind of spend is about 2.7 billion, coming up to three, maybe four billion per month as, as the war um, dra drags on uh, in, in, that, in that country. So the, the IMF has actually um, created a sort of special channel through which donations and, uh, and, and money can actually uh, go, to, um, go to Ukraine. Um, as far as the United States is concerned, again, most things really um, hanging on until we get those inflation figures uh, later today. Um, and that, that really is, is governing everything, um, even though the, 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 the rel there's, a, there's a relative calm about the markets there. Um, and, and I think that's because they've had some quite strong inflation figures. Inflation may, may peak between 6 and 7% this year, but but, and this is the important thing, may fall off to between 2 and 3% next year. That's the latest kind of idea about that. Um, Elon Musk bucket, backing out of um, the Twitter board may open, the, uh, may open Twitter to a hostile takeover. Maybe him, possibly. Uh, because he doesn't have to go by any rules, you know, given that he's decided uh, not to join the, 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 the Twitter board, maybe other companies too. Here's a good one. If you don't understand what this is about, then you need to ask your children. Trust me, this is important. Epic Games have announced they've got, they've got $2 billion from Sony and from Lego to create their own, uh, their own metaverse, their own universe. And this is important because lots of companies are now heading towards this gaming space because they know that that's what young people actually uh, want to do. Um, the UK economy is slowing down. Um, sales uh, are, are falling as well. I'll bring you the latest employment figures in just a moment, but it's worth, worth noticing that the traffic chaos around Dover because of that perfect storm of an IT failure, holidays coming up, which should have been anticipated, the P&O dispute and so on, that means that lorries are actually queuing. And the, the Hawley is a, 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 a saying that this is actually bringing, you know, a terrible kind of vision about a place to do trade, which the UK um, d depends upon as a, a sort of throughput from here to the continent and and, and vice versa. Um, the snapshot of the economy, retail sales down yesterday, economic growth stuttering, and we have unemployment, um, uh, wage growth actually below inflation, uh, and, and unemployment though at its lowest since 1974. And, and, but we still cannot get people into jobs at airports and so on to make that, that traffic slightly better. It's felt industry figures are saying this morning that the, the, the throughput in airports is not going to improve for another year because all the staff have to be vetted. Um, oil has dropped to below $100 a barrel. And that's basically because of China and l lack of uh, lack of demand there. And, and finally, Bitcoin has gone below uh, $40,000 for the first time. Um, again, I was looking at Bitcoin, you know, a couple of months ago and saying that th this really, this is kind of... Um, um, this, this re-look at riskier assets is something which people are looking at Bitcoin now and a guarantee of its survival and where it's where it is in the world at the moment. And like most risky assets, it's falling. That is the global view this morning. I mean, Michael, good morning. If wage rate is paid, it's, it's pegged below inflation or wage rate now is below inflation in the UK. Is that not a recipe for long term poverty? And when you even look at the workforce, yes, people are getting workforce, but they're getting money that they can't really spend because it's been eclipsed by inflation at the same time. So what is really happening to the economy? Then what happened, you know, to all the stimulus spendings and the likes? What happened really? Because it's, it's abysmal. Secondly, I want to talk about Elon Musk. What do you think Elon Musk is driving out at Twitter? Does he want to stifle Twitter? Is it a response, you know, to how Twitter treated the likes of uh, Donald Trump? Does he have right-wing tendencies? Uh, 
we're, we're guessing about Elon Musk. I don't really know what he's doing, to be honest. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch anything like Twitter or anything to social media at all. Um, I wouldn't want to get involved with it because I feel as though those are the sorts of companies that are that are going to fall foul of big reg regulatory problems. They're becoming they're not they're not just um, accumulators of news. They're actually attempting to create it. When you start doing things like that, then you get into very very deep water about being responsible for your coverage and so on, as every news organisation around the world does. So I, I, don't, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, maybe, maybe he's about to open a, um, a hostile bid for it, as I was suggesting he could do if he wanted to. Um, I, I, I suspect that what, what, what Twitter was saying yesterday is that Elon Musk's lack of attention to this and lack of, lack of wish to join the board actually takes another distraction away from getting Twitter to where it wants to be in, in, the, in, in, in the metaverse. I, I, I simply don't know as far as what, what, what his political implications are absolutely uh, no idea um, as far as the UK is concerned I mean most countries wouldn't mind an unemployment rate of 3.8 percent it's not been there since 1974 um, the question is it can't can't get people to the right kind of jobs and certainly the most the most urgent thing I mean wage growth is one thing certainly I think the most urgent thing is to get the airports and the, and the, and the ports um, and service industries working again and people have to be trained for these jobs and certainly as far as airports are concerned, and you'll know this as well from your local airport, they're not just airports, they're like cities, aren't they? There's lots of different op um, lots of different occupations there, and it's really building those up, but the most important ones, of course, are those which need to be vetted as far as security is concerned, and that will take a long, long time. So I feel as though we'll be bumping along the bottom for a while to come. Well, uh, Michael, quickly. Yesterday you talked about Rishi Sunak. Um, what are we dealing with here? Collusion between kleptocracy and oligarchy, or, what, or morality, is that what we're dealing with? Uh, Rishi Sunak, as Chancellor says, he has done the right thing in all circumstances. And yet he's a member of the cabinet. He identifies as a British uh, citizen. He lives in uh, uh, England, but he says his permanent residence is in the United States. His wife is Indian. She lives in England, but she too has a permanent residency in another part uh, of the world. Okay, some persons have said, what we're dealing with is tax evasion. And tax evasion is not a crime uh, in many uh, jurisdictions. So what really is at stake? Now that the uh, prime minister has ordered an investigation, this investigation, is it just an attempt uh, to save face, a cover up, the prime minister trying to protect uh, his chancellor, that one too. You said earlier that uh, oil price has gone down, but in another report, we've been told that with the uh, zoning system that has now been adopted in Shanghai, uh, WTI and uh, Brent crude has gone up slightly, and that uh, China uh, has affected the uh, demand and supply equation uh, within the global uh, oil uh, market. But the bigger issue is that the trade data from China, we're told, well, we'll get the details tomorrow, on Wednesday, that's when they were announced it indicates that there's been reduction, not just in exports, but also in imports because of the closure of places like Shanghai, Guangdong, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Guangzhou, and uh, Jilin province uh, close to the border with uh, Hong Kong. Is China facing the prospect of a recession? And is the decision to open up, to zone out Shanghai, uh, you know, determined by uh, you know, uh, prospects, uh, issues of economic survival. All right, let's, let's do Rishi Sunak first, and let, let's do the legal thing, shall we? So tax evasion is the illegal part of things. Tax avoidance is not illegal. Tax evasion is the, is, the, is the illegal part of things, and there is no suggestion that that's what the Chancellor has actually done. I mean, my, my complaint about it is, and as you know, I don't get involved in politics, I cannot understand how anybody taking a, um, a, an office of state like that allows any sort of question marks about their financial affairs, background, geography, family, and all the rest of it. You need to, if you want to do this, you need to be squeaky clean. Name me somebody who is squeaky clean. I think you'd struggle, actually. Um, as far as uh, as far as China's concerned, what goes on there, as as I 
do keep saying is a complete mystery. All we can judge is what's actually happening. The oil markets have taken it upon themselves to bring the price of oil down because they assume that what China is actually doing is, is slowing down. There's, 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 there's not, not the demand there. I, I do think that in the future they're going to face the sort of problems that most developed economies actually do, which is an ageing population, but that's not happening right now. So the government's got a lot to do. It can print it its own money, number one. So that takes care of that. It needs to it needs to be seen to be managing what on earth is happening in the property sector there. That experiment to get into private sector property development has quite clearly failed. That because there's just not just not the, the, the take up uh, for it. So you know nobody to buy the flats, nobody to buy the apartments, nobody to buy the buy the buy the property. It doesn't take a genius to understand that's a that's that that's a failed experiment. Never mind what the government does. If you're really asking me, I think that what, what I keep saying is, I think there's a gradual dismantlement of what's going on there. Um, so I think that you've got Chinese authorities, and it is an autocracy, and they wish to save face. I think far more interesting is actually where China is going to find, to find itself aligning itself with Russia uh, and India and so on, uh, when, when, the, when the great powers and these great tectonic plates actually stop moving around. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. Thank you very much indeed. Now, dependable Rotus Sadiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you all. I'll right, quickly jump into it. Uh, MTN Nigeria has released, uh, released, received um, its uh, final approval for uh, its uh, Momo Payment Service Bank um, uh, license from the uh, central bank. So that, of course, is mobile money, you know, PSB, so it's Payment Service Bank Limited. And this, of course, allows them to be able to, 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 to transact in financial services. Now, they cannot engage in foreign exchange. They also cannot give out loans and advances, but they're going to be targeting rural areas and they're going to be, be able to, to, at least as far as financial inclusion is concerned, give uh, access to financial services through its uh, mobile money payment service bank uh, license. Now, a couple stats from Standard Bank. Let's take a look at what, um, what this means. In fact, funny enough, I drew this from the reports on insurance, but you know, mobile, mobile payments are just, it's so, they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous. So this is according to Standard Bank Group, today the number of mobile money wallets in Africa exceed bank account registrations, which underscores the necessity for using mobile as a frontier channel to allow users access to a range of financial amenities, including making payments. We move on, I think there's some stats that they, uh, they also give out. Let's take a look at this next uh, data point here. <clears throat> Growth of mobile services across Africa, 495 million subscribed 2020, 46% of the entire continent's population, 4.2% growth versus 2019 from the GSMA. GSMA holds that big mobile conference every year. I think the last one was in Barcelona this year. Also, uh, projected revenues, 3.5 billion 2020, could grow to 14 to 20 billion by 2025. And check this out. Kenya and Ghana second and third after China for mobile payment use. We know Ghana just passed their e-levy bill, that very contentious bill, because you can see here, I mean, because of the potential of, of revenues um, for mobile payments. So you can, you, you look at this holistically across the African continent, these, the, this is big. Um, also, I mean, Airtel Africa also got their approval in principle. They haven't gotten final approval yet, but we're, I don't know, we're expecting that um, to be uh, announced any, you know, who knows, any day now. Uh, remember, last week uh, I talked about MTN, uh, well, actually the group, MTN South Africa, possibly spinning off their mobile division and getting JP Morgan to advise them on that. So, uh, you know, you're pretty excited about this stuff, right, Rufai? So <laughs> the potentials are, are pretty huge. Uh, we moved, speaking of South Africa, um, the... Association of Importers and Exporters of Meats and uh, Poultry, they want to reduce the tariffs on imported poultry into, um, into the nation. Costs are increasing. I mean, wheat, of course, which comes from Ukraine, Russia, is part of poultry feed. That's rising. Supply chain issues are also putting some pressure on prices. So it's increasing. So they want the government to remove the tariffs. Now, there's a, there's the other side of the equation is that you've got local producers. I think the poultry industry in South Africa employs about 100,000 people or so, 150,000. Those poultry producers need to be protected. So if you scrap the tariffs and allow importers their way, I think they're saying that the cost will go down about 33% on you know, boneless chicken, another frozen chicken that is imported into the country. Then you're going to now flood the market um, with imported chicken, which will now impact um, local producers. 
something very interesting I noticed. Do you know that the cost of chicken in South Africa has risen by just 10% over the last decade? Mm. Decade, mm. 10%. How much you pay for chicken last time you bought chicken in Nigeria? It's incredible, right? So this is again, this is part of the when I when we talk about the impact of inflation and you know um, purchasing power and protecting purchasing power. Da, 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 I thought that was pretty incredible, ten percent rise. But then still prices are increased. So this is the tug of war. Now South Africa has already intervened in fuel levies. They plan on reducing fuel levies for the average South African there. I think in, in intervening in other areas as well. I think they want to reduce excise duties on soft, on soft drinks. So the importers are like, OK, well, you know what? Let's, they haven't put this proposal forward yet. But they're like, OK, let's officially see if they'll intervene in, uh, in chicken um, as well. Um, exactly. Speaking of excise duties, quickly and wrap up with Kenya. Um, the Kenya, the Treasury is seeking a 20 percent tax on gambling. So for whatever money you wager, on, on, on a bet, uh, that's Umar Yaktani. He's the cabinet secretary in uh, Kenya's uh, treasury, uh, treasury department. So essentially, they are seeking it like, I don't know, I think it's like 200 shillings for every 1,000 shillings you wager. But they tried this last year, it was shut down. It's at 7.5% right now. They tried it last year, the MPs didn't go for it. I think they tried it a few years back. The gambling companies there successfully lobbied these companies are so powerful when it yeah. comes to lobbying all over the world. Yeah. They successfully lobbied and shut it down. So their financial year for Kenya begins in July. They've got a new budget they're putting forward. They're looking for revenue. So I don't think it'll pass, but we'll see if they can, uh, if they can do it. They also made a moral argument. They said gambling is very bad. It's bad for the youth, and, no, but, but, but they but, want to raise money. But, but it's a good way to raise money. Oh, of course tax. it is. But, but yeah. I, want to, yeah. I want to talk about the chicken thing. It's a bad policy. You know why? To remove the tariffs. Yeah, to yeah. remove the tariffs. Because you know why? Most of those chickens that are coming in from abroad are subsidized. Mm. The governments of those countries are subsidizing those chicken and agri produce so that they can sell them quickly so that the farmers can get their money back. Right. And they also get guarantees. You remember the big protest where they poured milk away mm. because they were at variance with the government. The, in fact, you subsidize for every cow, you know, every cow in the developing country yep. earns more than most Nigerians per day. It's sad. I'm right, serious. Right. You subsidize cow daily with, I think, about a dollar or two. And most Nigerians live on less than two dollars per day. Right, right. So if they are subsidizing to make their economy better and, and to make their farmers, farmers be able to put output, and you're not reducing tariff for them, so it's a double win for them. What you're supposed to do is keep the tariff off and take the tariff to, to be able to subsidize local farmers in South Africa so that they can upscale production. And it's quite appalling for a country of over 60 million people. The agri um, um, the food, the poultry sector mm. just employs 100,000 people. South Africa should be doing way more than a million people South Africa, if the no. government is taking the money they subsidize from import mm. and using it to bolster the sector. But well, their employment is very high. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I oh, please go. have no argument against sin tax, which is what I see. Okay, Kenya, as, right? Yes, okay. as is what's happening in Kenya, you have to pay for your vices. Right. Whether it's soft drinks, whether it's um, cigarettes or gambling, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Yes, I have no argument against So if they put there's a debate there. 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 What is the lesson for Nigeria? Yes. In Nigeria, the lottery business, the gaming business is doing. You're talking about Kenya, well, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah, talking okay. about Kenya, and yeah. I'm trying to see if there are lessons <clears throat> right. that Nigeria can draw from what has been done in Kenya. Mm. In Kenya in 2019, the 20% tax on what punters put in was proposed. The parliament uh, in the Finance Act of 2020 threw it out, mm. you know, of the uh, government uh, proposal. And now Kenya authorities uh, are They're trying back. to go back to <laughs> Again. that to say, if you have enough free money, to go and gamble, then maybe government should take something out of it. The explanation may be religious, it may just be government trying to raise uh, revenue. But here in Nigeria, we face a similar situation. So many young men, all these I do lazy bones, you know, all over the place. Ah, lazy youth. Who, who, do, not, <laughs> <laughs> who do not want to work. You know, every day you see them, they are gambling, they are into lottery, they are into gaming. Uh, the Yoruba is called, uh, call it uh, a you know, uh, some people talk about Baba Jebu yes. and all of that. You know, people want to get rich quickly. Now, you may not question the morality of it, but if it's a way of uh, gaining revenue for government from that indulgence, I think it's a good idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it must go uh, even beyond the punters. Once upon a time in this country, we had an issue with someone going to court or approaching the ESCC to say that, look, this 
uh, lottery companies. They are not paying tax. Mm. And uh, they're just criminal off without uh, playing their own part. But it's not just the lottery and gaming companies in Nigeria that are not paying uh, relevant tax. Uh, other people to commit the same offense. Yeah. So maybe Nigeria should look at the uh, example of Kenya again. Mm. You know, I don't gamble. I don't like gambling. Right. You know, speaking for myself. Yeah. But the ones who are ready to gamble, you know, maybe they should, uh, you know, be asked to put in uh, a little money a little, a little to more. justify their indulgence. There's a debate now, there. The other yeah. thing is this uh, Momo MTN company. This is not the first time. In November last year, mm. the... Um, uh, CBN said it was going to grant licenses within six months yep. if people were able to meet uh, the conditions. At that, at that time, it was uh, MTN and Airtel right. Africa. This time around, it is uh, MTN that has been granted uh, the license. Yeah. Okay, where is Airtel? Is Airtel still going through the process? Mm. In 2019, uh, what's his name? Uh, this company, um, Globalcom. Yes. And another company, I think it was uh, Nine Mobile, right? We also granted licenses, existing licenses. Are those licenses. Well, approval in principle. Operative. Yeah. yeah. Oh, approval in principle in since yeah. 2019. Yeah, that's yeah. what MTN yeah. is just in, getting. In now. November, yeah. that was also approval in principle. Yes. Right. For and now it's only MTN that has the final that approval. That has the right final right. Yeah. approval. Yeah. Okay. What is the implication? Quickly, if you can do that in 30 seconds mm. for the banking industry, because mm. Is this like in PESA, in Kenya, mm. you know, and do you think we have the enabling environment mm. for this financial inclusion mm. strategy? All right. Because that's what mobile money yes, is all, it's about. all about. Very quickly, we have a bank-led uh, financial inclusion model here in Nigeria. So remember, they are not allowed to participate in, uh, to transact in foreign exchange. They are also not allowed to give loans. So that's a stick with the commercial banks. So it's for financial inclusion to allow transactions, especially in rural areas. That's where the CBN wants them to be located. So the banks are still protected. It's not like in Kenya well, where it's a free fall. Thank you. Okay, right. we're gonna thank go, you uh, just to verify that fact, a cow earns $2.20, 2 euro 20. In, in the, subsidies, in the right? EU, yeah. In the subsidy every day. Wow. So most cows in the EU are probably richer, richer than us in this country. It's yeah. a sobering yeah. stats there, yeah. Yeah. sobering. All right, for update on COVID-19 pandemic, Adeswa Mora is here with us. Adeswa, great to have you. Morning. Morning, Adeswa. Yeah. Good morning. Great to be here. Good morning, Rafai. Morning. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Good morning, Tundu. Did I hear Pastor Tundu say gambling is okay? I never did. Well, that's I a topic never for another did. day, Tundu. <laughs> 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 okay, great. Great. Well, let's talk about COVID-19 this morning. In the next 24 to 48 hours, we should have a clearer picture of the pandemic toll in the last seven days around the world, according to the WHO Epidemiological Weekly Report. But currently, according to Johns Hopkins University tally, we now have 499 million infections with 6.1 million deaths and 11.1 billion vaccine doses administered globally. And in Nigeria, uh, we are told that 29 new cases and no COVID-19 related deaths uh, were officially reported in the last three days in the country. Recall that Nigeria has moved from daily reporting to three times in a week. Uh, the FCT, Lagos, Delta, Kaduna, Oyo, and River States are responsible for the 29 new infections that we have in Nigeria. Meanwhile, the Nigerian government has received 3.2 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, courtesy of the Italian government. Well, they were received yesterday in Abuja by Dr. Faisal Shoaib, who is the head of the NPHCDA. Now, uh, the shipment brings the number of donated vaccine doses by EU member states to 20 million. And by estimate, it's about 61% of uh, all the donated vaccine doses received in, in the country. Meanwhile, in Germany, the health ministry is preparing to destroy about 3 million vaccine doses by the end of June. A spokesperson from the Ministry of Health in Germany says the country has more vaccine than is being used and they cannot donate to poorer countries because the COVAX, va COVAX facility isn't uh, currently accepting donations for poorer countries at the moment. Many reasons can be attributed to that, although the German health officials didn't give any. 
and COVAX itself hasn't said anything recently. But we do know that many poorer countries had talked about how uh, these doses were sent to them close to expiry date. And, and some have even said, we need them. Let's have the shipment on a needs, uh, to, a needs basis. Uh, so we don't just have them sitting down in our countries, but when we do need them, then we can ask for them or you can help us deliver. And very quickly to China, where Shanghai has reported a new record of more than 26,000 COVID-19 infections in 24 hours, as officials are seeking uh, to reassure residents that they have now secured enough supplies of basic necessities. Uh, other cities, including the southern city of Gan Zoo are in, introducing new restrictions and building makeshift hospitals as the government continues to stick to its dynamic zero COVID policy. Guangzhou is home to many top companies and China's busiest airports. Schools have now reverted to online teaching. Only citizens with a definite need, according to officials, are allowed to leave Guangzhou at the moment and they must test negative 48 hours before they leave the city. Well, the World Health Organization yesterday said it is monitoring developments in China, uh, but it doesn't have enough information to make an assessment yet. And I think everybody should be watching China where it all began, even though their cases are still very minimal compared to some countries' caseload at the moment. However, it's the highest we are seeing in China since the pandemic truly began uh, there more than two years ago. Back to you guys. Well, China. Let's start with uh, Guangzhou. Guangzhou has uh, a population of 18 million uh, people. It's the home to, uh, you know, many uh, major companies. Only 27 cases were reported on Monday. But despite that, and despite the fact that the U.S. consulate in, uh, uh, in Shanghai is uh, advising, uh, you know, uh, non-essential staff and others against arbitrary uh, decisions that may be taken by the Chinese authorities, the Chinese authorities are still insisting on the zero COVID policy that they have adopted. However, Shanghai, uh, a, a city of 28 million people, 28 million, yes, provides uh, another test case. You recall that Shanghai was uh, about two, three weeks ago divided into the Eastern District and the uh, Western uh, District when it was discovered that uh, the numbers were going up to about 20, over 20,000 cases per day, even if most of them were asymptomatic, and most of those cases were Omicron uh, cases. Now, what has now happened in Shanghai, uh, which is also a major manufacturing hub, along with uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, you know, and other places, what has now happened is that there has been a U-turn. Now, Shanghai has been divided into three zones, a control zone, you know, a free zone, and uh, a monitoring zone. Uh, going forward. So what you find here is that you now find China, even despite the fact that it's insistent on zero COVID policy, with the effect on the economy that has been witnessed in places like Shanghai, with the anger of the people, because Shanghai compared to other places like Yuzhou and other places, you know, did not have this total zero COVID uh, policy uh, lockdown. But they had to adopt that. Now they are modifying it which means that even in China, despite the insistence on the zero COVID policy, uh, there has been a, a shift, a subtle shift in uh, Shanghai, also for economic reasons, which is the uh, you know, pattern that we have seen uh, in many parts of uh, Europe and also uh, North America. But OK, the producer is shouting, we are overrun you, we are overrun you. So let me uh, allow the producer to calm down. Thank you very much, uh, Adeswa.